Hi, my name is Justin Salomon, and I'm going to discuss meniscus repair, anatomical reduction, and uniform compression with the circumferential compression stitch. In disclosure, I'm the founder and chief medical officer of Soterix Orthopedics and a consultant for MoxiMed. So if we want to improve meniscus repair, we need to start by looking at the basic science. We know that the fibers of the meniscus run predominantly in a circumferential orientation and studies have shown that we should place our sutures vertically so that they traverse perpendicular to these circumferential fibers and that horizontal orientation of repair stitches has an increased likelihood to cut through. We also know that the blood supply to the meniscus has been shown to be mostly within the peripheral third, but the avascular zones may receive a significant amount of nourishment from the synovial fluid from imbibition, diffusion, and mechanical pumping. Bird and Sweet have also shown there to be canal-like structures that penetrate deep into the surface of the meniscus that may serve as a conduit for nutrients to help these zones heal, and growth factor expression in the vascular and avascular zones have been shown to be similar. And so it follows that in the non-arthritic knee, the synovial fluid brings nutrients to help the avascular zone heal, but we also know that the synovial fluid fills all gaps and prevents healing in any tear region that's not anatomically reduced and compressed. We also know from studying free body diagrams that the surrounding joint surfaces place a significant amount of gapping force on the tibial side of a vertical meniscus tear, and that it may be biomechanically more important to fix the tibial side of a tear than the femoral side. We've also learned that the meniscus has a significant amount of translation that occurs as the knee is ranged, and perhaps meniscus entrapment to capsule can in part explain why contact forces in areas although improved from the torn state with traditional repair, don't completely restore the intact state. So from a mechanical standpoint, our goal is to anatomically reduce the tear, preventing gapping, and so that the torn edges are in contact with each other and not partially with an articular meniscal surface, implying a pore reduction. A vertical orientation to the suture patterns so that they don't cut through. Evenly compress not just the superior, but also the middle and inferior aspects of the tear and avoid entrapping the surrounding structures so that the meniscus has its freedom of movement. It would also be very nice to avoid neurovascular risk and to improve ease of use. Now we typically repair peripheral vertical tears and that's because we know that there's a good peripheral blood supply but it's also because there's a large central meniscus fragment that's big enough for us to use our traditional central to peripheral needle penetration techniques. These techniques are being performed more and more with all inside devices, which allow the surgeon to perform central to peripheral needle penetration across the tear with fixation into the perimeniscal capsule. One of the advantages to this technique is that it's relatively easy to do, and you can achieve good compression at the region where the fixation is placed. But you commonly get displacement and gap formation at the undersurface because it's harder to place these somewhat large diameter needles through the tibial side of the meniscus in every region of tearing. And these uncompressed regions fill with synovial fluid and are hence unlikely to heal. And another problem is that it may cause entrapment of the meniscus to capsule and decrease the natural meniscus motion that we spoke about earlier. It also might to some degree cause iatrogenic extrusion of the meniscus that may be why menisci can sometimes look a bit peripheralized after repair with these traditional techniques. And sometimes we repair them in a bit of flexion and then we immobilize them in extension which may further peripheralize the posterior horn region. And then there's always neurovascular risk with any central to peripheral needle penetration technique. The needle diameters with the all inside devices is typically bigger than the outside in and inside out needles. And if you add to that the implant size on top of the hypotube of the needle, it can be considerably large. Depicted here is the second implant coming through a fast fix 360. And this is important because if these are lined up vertically as we'd like to do, it can propagate a radial tear. Inside Out is still largely the gold standard for repair, and I greatly respect the work of Dr. Frank Noyes. Inside Out does require an incision. However, Dr. Noyes shows that you can get 95% good results in the red-red junction and 83% success in the red-white junction by following the premises of anatomical reduction and uniform compression, just like every tissue in the body. He repairs the superior and inferior aspects of the tear at every region and he separates the stitches by no more than five millimeters. It can be difficult to get these stitches in on the tibial side because of the tibial plateau and the angle, but it is possible. 
and Dr. Noyes will repair many tear types and in an array of patient ages. The problem with inside out is that it requires the disgust incision. There is neurovascular risk that OR times tend to be a bit longer than the all-inside devices. It usually requires an assistant to harvest the needles as they're passed through the meniscus. And there's a risk of the needle stick during this process. The incision and, and dissection of the capsule sometimes does lead to more post-op pain. And in the end, the resultant stitch is still central to peripheral needle penetration across the tear with fixation into the perimeniscal capsular tissues. And so that brings us to the circumferential compression stitch, which instead is passed directly from bottom to top through the meniscus to encircle the tear and anatomically reduce both the tibial and femoral sides of the tear with each stitch. This results in the tear edges being completely and uniformly compressed together to maximize contact of the tear edges and lock the synovial fluid out of the tear. It also allows for incorporation of more central edge tissue into the repair, potentially decreasing the risk of cut through compared to traditional all inside, outside in, and inside out techniques. It also allows for a pair of tears that were typically considered difficult to repair, such as horizontal cleavage tears. In this case, the central edge would be removed because the tear goes all the way into the apex. And radial tears can now be repaired directly from side to side with ideal vectors and with anatomical reduction and uniform compression of the femoral and tibial sides of the tear at the same time. And it can also be used at the level of the popliteal hiatus without risk of entrapment of surrounding structures. So this is the Soterix Nova Stitch device designed to sneak into and out of the joint to pass the circumferential compression stitch. And it does so by having a flexible upper jaw, which is radius to follow the shape contour of the meniscus and femoral condyle, and a protractable retractable lower jaw, which extends in line with the shaft of the device, and then an atraumatic needle. The needle is actually smaller on cross section than even an inside out needle that we talked about earlier. And then the shaft of the device is three millimeters in height, which allows it to fit anywhere that a three millimeter shaver can be fit between the meniscus and the tibia. And this is because the upper jaw is designed to fall behind the femoral condyle before the lower jaw is extended underneath the meniscus. The suture is then passed directly from lower jaw to upper jaw on both sides of the tear to complete the circumferential compression stitch and it does so without needle projection towards neurovascular structures or chondral surfaces. There's a specialized knot pusher suture cutter that makes the surgery much more enjoyable and knot tying a lot easier. And this is because it's designed to snap onto the suture and because it has a terminal plunger so you can push on the knot rather than passing point. I do overhand, overhand, underhand, or do the same throw twice and then an opposite throw, tighten it up a little bit, and then pull on the post, and it slides down to the meniscus. Then the knot pusher is snapped onto the stitch and two additional alternating half hitches are placed. And then after you've tied the knot, it cuts it easily by sliding the gold sheath over the central sheath with the thumb trigger. So why might this improve outcomes? Well, you anatomically reduce the tissue, you avoid entrapment of the capsule, you decrease or eliminate neurovascular risk, every stitch ends up being vertical for vertical and horizontal tears, incorporate more central edge tissue into the repair, have optimal repair vectors for horizontal and radial tears, it can be used at the popliteal hiatus, it has a small needle that penetrates in line with the circumferential fibers, and it allows complex suture placement when appropriate. Okay, so now for some clinical examples out of my own patient population. I'm going to show some examples of vertical, horizontal, and radial tears all repaired with the circumferential compression stitch. You can also do figure of eights and double locking loop stitches for root repair. So the first example is a vertical tear in a 27-year-old male in conjunction with an ACL using an older, larger version of the device about two and a half years ago. And I placed two circumferential compression stitches around this tear and tied somewhat large femoral-sided knots. He had complete resolution of lateral-sided symptoms, but he did go on to develop a cyclops lesion, and I was able to go back to debride it. At the time of second look arthroscopy eight months later, like Dr. Scaglione had suggested with the fast fix, the sutures had synovialized and the knots had embedded into the meniscus. And the meniscus tear had nicely healed. And I'll go ahead and pull back and range the femur so you can see that there's no nicking or grooving of the femoral cartilage. And also notice that the meniscus is sitting within the joint. It's not extruded or entrapped in any way. 
Now let's move on to radial tears, and there's good literature to support that these heal, and the circumferential compression stitch may even improve upon these outcomes, as it's recently been shown to have statistically significantly lower displacement and higher load to failure and stiffness compared to inside-out stitches. So this is a 25-year-old male with a pretty catastrophic lateral meniscus tear at the level of the popliteal hiatus adjacent to the lateral meniscal root, and the neurovascular bundle lived right behind that root stump there. The suture, as before, is placed from lower jaw to upper jaw where it's atraumatically self-retained, and then the lower jaw is retracted, and the device is removed. And multiple side-to-side -side stitches can be placed. In this case, three non-absorbable sutures were placed, one peripherally, one in the middle, and then a third stitch was placed centrally and shuttled for PDS, as this was before I had the second look showing that there was truly no chondral damage. Now he wants to return to football, and so eight months later, a vision scope needle arthroscopy is performed, and excellent healing was observed. And he did return to football and is now two years out and symptom-free. The next radial tear example is in a 14-year-old female where she had a radial tear of the junction of the body and anterior horn. This is a tricky region. Two stitches were actually placed back in the body with this device, and then a suture lasso, or a spectrum in this case, was used to shuttle the, uh, one of the suture strands from each stitch back across. So this illustrates it's not about the device, it's really about the stitch. This stitch going uh, around the tear and compressing the tibial and femoral side at the same time is what's important here. And she's six months out and doing extremely well, completely asymptomatic. The next case is a 19-year-old male, and he lost the posterior horn of his meniscus, and I found it in the posterior notch. So this fragment was pulled down, and you can see how it's lost its normal shape, and it would be really easy to remove this meniscus, but he's 19, and this would have been a significant meniscectomy to remove this portion. So because it doesn't have an apex anymore, I went ahead and did hay bale stitches, which is where the suture is placed behind the meniscus remnant and then tied in the front. And I relied on the fact that he's 19 to remodel this meniscus into a functional shape. And in the absence of arthritic change, there are enough nutrients in the synovial fluid to allow this meniscus to not just heal, but also to be remolded by the femur and the tibia. So four months later, a vision scope needle arthroscopy was performed, and starting in the notch where the meniscus used to be, I'll swing back down into the joint, and I can use something called a saline probe to flash the meniscus with saline and watch it move, and that helps confirm that the tissue is viable and intact, and amazingly, it's reformed to central edge, and it looks great. I must have dragged down a little bit of fat with my knot, and that's why that suture hasn't fully synovialized, but there's no surrounding chondral damage. Okay, and now for horizontal cleavage tears. We know that both benign neglect and removal of one lamina result in significantly altered contact pressures in areas, and we know that removing a lamina might not provide significant symptom relief at two years out. And there is evidence in the literature that horizontal cleavage tears heal, and there's no evidence that they can't. And so this is a 28-year-old female with a horizontal cleavage tear at the level of the popliteal hiatus. So the upper jaw is placed between the meniscus and the femur, and lower jaw extended. The sutures passed behind the meniscus but in front of the popliteus and then tied around the apex after a biter is used to square off the edge and remove some of the central third white-white tissue. One year later, on vision scope needle endoscopy, to uh, guide rehab, return to sport, and to assess healing, the meniscus is reformed into the shape of an apex, and it's nicely healed. The only thing that's left of the suture that's visible is the very top of that knot. The sutures have synovialized and embedded within the meniscus, and I believe that they may act as rebar to help prevent uh, this blistering uh, type of tear from recurring. The next case is another quick example of a chronic horizontal cleavage tear, this time in a 33-year-old female with significant persistent symptoms. There's a flap to the inferior lamina that's folded posteriorly by the tibia, and then there's a large horizontal cleavage tear of the entire body. And again, the sutures will be placed behind the meniscus, but in front of the popliteus, and tied around the squared off apex. And because it's now easy to do, I'll keep placing sutures until I can't get a probe into any region of tearing, so there's no gapping, and the tissue is circumferentially and completely compressed. 
And then five months later, a vision scope is performed and it looks good, consistent with their clinical outcomes. It's interesting, you can really see how the sutra synovial eyes and the knots embed into the meniscus, similar to the other cases. I'll swing over here to the left and show you a nice one right next to the femur. You can see there's no chondral damage. And she's done great. The final example is uh, intrasubstance degeneration. So this was a 25-year-old female who had a very symptomatic in intrasubstance degeneration to her medial meniscus. And she was getting very frustrated and depressed uh, because of the amount of pain and limited function. So the device is placed into the posterior compartment of the knee and you don't need to see back there. The first stitch will go behind the meniscus and then the next uh, other limb of the stitch will be placed more centrally. Interestingly, in this meniscus, when I would turn the suction on, the whole meniscus would flop forward anteriorly like a bucket handle, but there was no discernible tear. And when suction was, re was released and the flow went back into the knee, it would reduce. So you can see that this tissue is not normal. It's pretty floppy and soft back there, but nicely compressed with these circumferential compression stitches. This whole case took 25 minutes. At three months later, she's one of the most thankful patients I've ever had. She comes in crying. She finally feels better. I'll give you every slice. Pre-op is on the left and post-op three months later is on the right. And the signal has certainly improved. And symptomatically, she's profoundly improved. For rehab for all my patients shown in this video, I followed Dr. Noy's rehab for red white junction tears. I believe the contraindication to repair is when the tissue is crab meat and the meniscus can't hold a stitch. Or if there's significant grade 3 or 4 chondromalacia within the joint, I believe the synovial environment is altered and healing is less likely. I did not use PRP or any other biological augmentation to any of the repairs shown in the video today. And all surgeries were done with the patient in the supine position with a leg in a leg holder and anesthesia was either general or local with MAC. And so now for some tips and tricks. Portal angle ends up being really important. You want it to be a straight shot to the undersurface of the meniscus. So it's imperative that a good skin incision point is established with the spinal needle before incision into the working portal. Too high and the device will interfere with the posterior aspect of the tibia and too low and you'll have to lever on the anterior horn of the meniscus or anterior tibia. Now when sewing the posterior horn, the original working portal works terrifically. But to sew the body region, the device needs to come across the knee and the camera needs to be moved to the original working portal. And often when doing this, the original camera portal is too low and you have to make an accessory portal about a centimeter higher so that as the device is brought across the, in front of the notch, the shaft of the device doesn't interfere with the tibial spine. Thank you very much for your time and interest.